Amazon. We're having it. So it was a great pleasure to be here at the meeting. This uh, research is part of a project that we have had for um, the last uh, three years on uh, value systems and contract farming. The results were presented uh, last year. Uh, it was a tricontinental uh, uh, project uh, led by the Samuel African Institute for Agrarian Studies and which, was, uh, which received the support uh, of the FAO, in fact. Um, the, although the FAO may not have liked our conclusions, I should add, um, <laughs> they expected a different yeah, conclusion I, I, from what we have gathered. Um, so we, our, our team in uh, Brazil uh, and Argentina, uh, we try to uh, undertake a, a broad uh, study based on secondary literature, given that none of us had actually uh, done any primary research on contract farming. So it was uh, quite new to us, this specific uh, 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 issue. Uh, and our approach was to map out some of the main tendencies in Brazil, in the different regions of Brazil, and uh, with our with our colleagues in Argentina uh, to broaden to 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 a bit more to South America. So uh, what I will present today, I won't go into the specifics of this, the various commodities that we that we studied, but I will just uh, paint a broad picture of uh, the historical perspective, uh, which has led to uh, modern day contract farming and globalized value systems. So that's my, I think, my task. I will speak about the historical perspective. I will also speak a bit about the determinants of entry into into contract. Why uh, uh, small farmers and some larger farmers and uh, enter into contract. So um, that's my task. The emergence of uh, modern contract farming is a key feature uh, of the long agrarian transition in South America which has culminated in the formation of a corporate agro-industrial value system integrated into world markets. Modern contract farming gained momentum in the 1980s uh, as a remedy to the uh, profitability crisis in agriculture as in the economies generally of the region and on terrain of uh, persisting inequalities in the countryside. So that's uh, first of all, there is a, a crisis, the, the debt crisis generally that struck Latin America, um, uh, but also the, the existing inequalities and asymmetries in power relations that existed. That was the, 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 the terrain on which this new agro-industrial uh, value system uh, grew. So South American agricultures today include the historically uh, privileged, privileged large-scale farmers, who rank amongst the most productive by world standards, uh, alongside a differentiated set of smaller farming units uh, striving for adequate conditions for their reproduction and uh, expansion, and additionally, uh, a labor force which subsists in the most vulnerable of uh, circumstances. Now, the study of value chains often uh, ignores the labor aspect of it. So we have tried to uh, bring in this dimension uh, in our studies. Uh, this differentiation in the inheritance of patterns of colonial and post-colonial land appropriation by European settlers, which were, um, uh, were only marginally modified by mid 20th century uh, uh, piecemeal land reforms. The latter, the, the land reforms, uh, were subsequently overtaken by state-led strategies of agro-industrial modernization defined by the Green Revolution, uh, which introduced renewed trends towards land concentration. Now, popular pressures for land reform marked the South American countryside throughout the 20th century, the whole Latin American uh, region. Uh, in the interwar years, the general economic crisis 
uh, and unrest ushered in a new phase of uncertainty, which gave way to a search for economic strategies and inward-looking development paths. The results were diverse, with some countries taking the path of robust, especially Brazil, of robust industrial transformation. Yet popular pressures for land reform did not cease. They were partially absorbed by palliative land reform measures before being suppressed by the military regimes that swept the subcontinent from the 1950s onwards. It is thus that the agrarian transition came to be subordinated definitively to the emerging modernization paradigm, setting into motion a process of mechanization and accelerated rural exodus, uh, the rearticulation of markets under the aegis of corporate agriculture, and the transformation of agrarian and labor relations. Now, the creation of a new corporate agro-industrial system, value system, took hold across across uh, all commodities, across the agricultural sector, in a process of transformation promoted by states, um, and I'm referring specifically to Brazil, but uh, it's, it's, uh, more generally uh, applies with uh, variations, uh, promoted by states via subsidies, price support mechanisms, production quotas, incentives for mechanization, and upgraded agricultural research capacities. The new integrated agro industrial value system expanded economies of scale, intensified land concentration, and reinforced tendencies towards oligopolistic markets. Thus, the birth of the modern corporate agro-industrial value system in South America propelled the much desired, on the one hand, gains in productivity, at the same time as it undermines small-scale producers who either persisted in the countryside by straddling farm and non-farm activities, or join the growing ranks of the urban poor, a tendency which persists to this day. Nonetheless, the debt crisis of the, of the 1970s struck at the heart of even the most productive sectors and eventually state-led uh, modernization strategy itself. The subsequent period of economic liberalization and deregulation from the 80s onwards was the turning point for the expansion of modern forms of contract farming organized by corporate agro-industrial enterprises. The retreat of the state from economic planning meant that producer prices and labor relations would begin to be deregulated and cede space to private sector initiatives <clears throat> in the reorganization of production. And additionally, that subsidized agricultural credit systems would be similarly be reorganized by cuts in lending, but also by redirection of priorities uh, in the interest of, of charging market price prices and attracting private banks and other operators into uh, uh, the financing of, of production. Contract farming thus became the rural counterpart. Yeah to a global movement towards corporate outsourcing yeah, as a means of reducing costs and risks, rearticulating markets, mobilizing finance and insurance towards these ends, and establishing new patterns of specialization. No single model of contract farming has emerged in, in Brazil and, and, and Argentina, which were our case studies. Um, studies show that contracting arrangements proceeded uh, by trial and error in diverse directions and, of course, conflicts as outsourcing accelerated in the 90s. Despite the policies uh, favoring large-scale farming, it is significant that a range of, of smaller-scale farming units persisted into the 2000s to become the target of public policies in support of so-called family agriculture. In the case of Brazil, for example, legislation was enacted in 2006 uh, to establish directives for the formulation of what eventually became the National Program for the Reinforcement of uh, uh, Family Agriculture. The acronym is PRONAF in, 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 in Portuguese. Uh, the 2006 
Agricultural and Livestock Census recorded that family farms, the so-called family farms, which included beneficiaries of land redistribution, farmers using exclusively family labor, and hybrid so-called farmers based on both family and contracted labor of up to half of total labor employed. Now, so these family farms, this category, accounted for 90% of farming units occupying 60% of arable land. While non -farm, the so-called non-family farms included those that hired in more than half of their total labor requirements and those that used hired labor exclusively, they occupied 6.7% of farming enterprises and 40% of the land. Furthermore, so we have these two broad categories, but within them there's also high differentiation. Yeah? Uh, so the exclusively family operated farms were nearly two thirds of the total farms, of which half were located, actually there was a regional distribution, half were located in the northeast of the country. So there is a regional uh, uh, imbalance, let's say, uh, in, in, these, uh, in this differentiation. Uh, the average size of exclusively family operated units was 32 hectares compared to the 383 hectares for the non-family capitalist enterprises. Yet even among the, the, the non-family enterprise, the big ones, um, uh, the, um, more than half, no, this, sorry, sorry. Uh, yet among the exclusively family operated farms, more than half had less than 10 hectares, yeah, uh, demonstrating a wide differentiation in this category. But also among the large-scale farmers, yeah, uh, who are located disproportionately in the south, southwest, and center west, yeah, there is high differentiation, including some farms that are above uh, 1,000 hectares. Um, now, contract farming advanced precisely on the, on the terrain of these inequalities, yeah, reproducing the established asymmetries in power relations that have historically characterized the South American countryside. Um, moreover, inequalities in access to land have increased over the last decade, despite public policies targeting family agriculture. Preliminary results of the most recent uh, uh, census have noted that land concentration has proceeded apace, registering a decline of 2% in total farming units and a rise of 5% in land used. Uh, concentration has occurred uh, among both family and non-family farms, uh, uh, and notably uh, large-scale farming enterprises of above 1,000 hectares have increased by some 3,000 units. So there's also merges and in, in, in concentration even in the big farming enterprises. So our report uh, of the re of this, on this research, first of all, tried to trace exactly these inequalities to understand under what conditions contract farming uh, is introduced into a country yeah, or a region. So uh, the report was based, as I said, on a wide range of uh, literature, secondary literature, um, and a, a wide range of commodities. Uh, ranging from uh, coffee, tobacco, orange, pigs, poultry, milk, tropical fruits, and yerba mate, which is a tea in Argentina. So we had uh, quite a, a large sample. Um, as for, uh, now why did, why, under what condition, we, these are the conditions under which contract farming was introduced. Now why, more specifically, uh, do farmers participate in, in contract farming? What are the determinants? Yeah. Uh, participation in contract farming has depended on various factors that act upon this differentiated range of producers. On the one hand, the established asymmetries continue to reduce the economic options available to the lowest rung of family units. On the other, the, the changing trends in the organization of production 
led by corporate agro-industrial enterprises, have set the pace in terms of the options offered to agricultural producers. The debt crisis in the 1980s and the trends in liberalization and deregulation obliged uh, states and firms alike to search for new organizational management and governance models in order to re uh, rescue profit margins in the sector. Uh, much of this search has unfolded, as I mentioned, by trial and error uh, to, to obtain diversity of, a diversity of, uh, of uh, contract models. Uh, however, the power of initiative has been primarily the privilege of, of corporate enterprises rather than the contracted farmers, um, despite the resistance to contracts that has also been part of this, of this, of this process. Uh, state policy, whether of, the, of a regulatory, financial, or social policy nature, has also contributed uh, by providing uh, incentives or disincentives for participation in contract farming. Now, from the point of view of the corporate contractors, the policy of outsourcing by means of a contract has the advantage of reducing costs and risks related to land, labor, and environmental disputes, while also guaranteeing the supply of raw material in the desired quantity, quality, and regularity. An additional advantage for contractors, uh, it must be said, has been the slow development of a legal, of a legal framework specific to contract farming, uh, uh, which, uh, which, was, which is very recent. Actually, uh, the, the laws for contract farming consolidated just two years, in 2016. Um, this issue was finally resolved in, in a certain sense. Um, while flexible labor relations have actually been advancing, yeah, generally, which together have reinforced the negotiating power of corporate contractors, if not also the farming units, whether small or large, which depend on labor. So the, the fact that the laws did not accompany these changes and the fact there was such a lag in, in, in developing legal frameworks was actually a, a bonus to the, the, the contractors because they could act, operate in a, in a legal vacuum. Yeah. From the point of view of the contracted farmers, uh, given the structural const constraints uh, which threaten the survival of farming operations and undermine the accumulation of savings uh, for the expansion of operations, the possibility of a contract provides, again, access to consumer markets and potentially uh, predictability and regularity of income. Access to credit is most often a key determinant uh, of participation in a contract. Uh, and this is a trend we have seen in so many other places. Uh, and this be, may be accompanied by inputs, technical assistance, uh, and logistical support organized by the corporate contractors themselves or other intermediaries. As such, geographic location uh, is also a factor in all this, um, given that production is most often oriented for markets at a distance. Uh, so the organization of these markets uh, uh, are important, whether they're national or, in fact, world markets. Uh, the ability to access such markets is overall an incentive to, to enter into contract. Uh, having said that, once land use and production has shifted to the requirements of the contract, the high opportunity costs of exiting the contract and diversifying operations, which could possibly imply default on debt and loss of assets, may also become a determinant of continued participation, even if the contract falls short of fulfilling promises and expectations. Mm. Some may be, well, this was a common uh, finding that there was much uh, discontent with contracts, but people stayed in them because the, the cost of exiting was possibly uh, higher. Uh, as such, the, the, the differentiated set of farming units in the countryside tend to experience contract farming in different ways. There's an observed tendency among certain crops under contract towards a selection of farming units uh, with higher economies of scale 
and capacities to survive the technological treadmill that is often entailed. Therefore, if the availability of markets, credit, inputs, technical assistance, and logistics explain the entry into a contract, there are also farming units that become path dependent or otherwise do not survive the contract and fall out. Uh, a further, how much time do I have? Sorry, another three minutes. Or three okay. Minutes. A further determinant of contract farming is the ability to mobilize family and hired labor yeah. to meet the production requirements of the contract. Small and large scale uh, farming units that hire labor operate with profit margins that tend to be viable only on the basis of informal and vulnerable and precarious labor or otherwise a differentiated labor force that includes a mix of a relatively few permanent laborers, laborers and a majority of informal and or seasonal and migratory laborers. So the, 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 the base of the whole contract farming system is a labor force which uh, is, gains very little from, uh, from this uh, uh, type of economy. The supply of a cheap and differentiated labor force therefore is a concrete factor which furthermore reproduces gender specific tasks and hierarchies. Higher paid laborers tend to be men, uh, while the lower paid may include both men and women, but in tasks which themselves may be construed very often in gender, in terms of gender. Even among uh, family farms that do not hire labor, contracts often uh, favor men who negotiate the contract and control the income while men, women participate in farming as well as reproductive work disproportionately. Uh, furthermore, the ability to sustain the, this, uh, the intensification of labor, which often accompanies contract farming, plays its role in the survival of the contract and may itself divert time from rest, leisure, or study, which again is experienced in a gendered manner. Uh, so I'm, I will bring this to a conclusion. I will just, there's one point uh, that I will not elaborate much here, but it's all written up anyway. Uh, there is a, about a public intervention in, a, 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 in contract, contract farming. The legal frameworks, I mean, there's a lot of detail in that which I won't go into, but just to say that the transition b beyond the state-led the prior state-led agro-industrial modernization strategy, this transition uh, resulted in the gradual repositioning of the state as a regulator of contracts, a mediator among parties, rather than a planner, uh, while retaining its focus on agricultural research and redirecting uh, its financial priorities in agriculture. So states are fully engaged in that sense. Uh, the rearticulation of markets via contracts um, has uh, been overseen by the state, even though in the case of Brazil specifically, a new legal framework specific to contract farming did not emerge until recently. Yeah. So states operate by commission or omission. The, the choice of states not to, not to intervene is also a choice. Yeah. Uh, it's also a type of intervention. Um, so the, the, the legal framework emerged in 2016. Arguably, the long delay in the establishment of a specific legal framework was functional to the proliferation of contract farming, given that for over three decades, it bestowed greater room for maneuver upon corporate contractors vis-a-vis -vis farmers to re-articulate markets in accordance with their national uh, and global strategies and experiment with contractual arrangements under existing power asymmetries. Uh, indeed, the whole period, our research shows, the whole period of, of transition to modern contract farming had been marked by conflicts over the terms and conditions of contracts and prices in particular. Thank you.